Good uh, evening, everybody. My name's Luke Bennett. I'm um, just introducing, uh, by way of a few slides, the Space and Place group before handing over to uh, Jim and Jack for this evening's session uh, entitled Sport and Physical Activity in Catastrophic Environments. You're all very welcome. Uh, by default, you'll all be on mute, um, but hopefully we'll have plenty of opportunity for uh, uh, discussion uh, a little bit later on uh, between and perhaps at the end of uh, the presenters. So let's get into uh, it, we are recording, uh, and as per the joining instructions that I sent round, um, our aim, my aim, uh, is to simply upload um, the raw recording from today, because it's too much faff to edit things. We don't normally need to edit things. Um, so just please be aware, if you do um, make a contribution, if we do decide to have um, vocal um, spoken um, Q&A, um, that you will be on the recording uh, and that it will be uploaded um, to the YouTube uh, channel, uh, which you can see a screenshot of here. Uh, the Shoe Space and Place group's been going for over a decade now, and in recent years, in the aftermath of COVID, really, we've embraced the online environment uh, and have had uh, some great series of events over the last three years. This year's theme has been uh, Changing Places, and this is the third uh, event in the Changing Places um, sequence. Recordings of previous events are on the YouTube site. Um, and by way of um, deviation, distraction, whatever, uh, we also slotted in four other events this year on the sub-theme of Changing Campus. So we've been quite busy uh, this year. Um, and as I say, all of those recordings are available for anyone who wants to view them um, on the YouTube site. You can see on the screen the kind of things that we ranged across under that heading of Changing Places and changing campus indeed. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to just hand over to uh, Jim and Jack to get uh, the show on the road. Gentlemen. Great stuff, thank you, Luke. I think Jack's gonna share the slides. Oh, can anyone see that? Yeah. Lovely, okay. Um, Thanks for, for joining us, everyone. I appreciate how difficult these events can be to get to, um, whether they're, they're in the day or in the evening. So uh, very much appreciate your time. Um, this is actually the first book launch um, for Jack and, and my book, um, Sport and Physical Activity in Catastrophic Environments. So naturally, we're, we're kind of really excited to, to get going with this and to hopefully get some um, constructive and maybe some critical feedback on the book itself on the basis of the session. Um, obviously, I'd like to, to start by just thanking Luke for facilitating the session and, and for allowing it to be part of this Space and Place seminar series. I've dipped in and out of the Space and Place um, seminars for a number of years now, and I, I've genuinely taken something away from every one of the sessions that I've been to. So um, Jack and I are just really excited to, to contribute in our own way and, and, and to do something to, to, to add to the group's, to the group's work. Um, it's worth mentioning that um, Routledge have kindly provided us with a discount code for the book for this evening's event. Um, I think we did have it on one of our slides, did we, Jack? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the discount code is just there on the right-hand side, FLA22. Um, so if you know you, you enjoyed the session today and, and maybe you kind of want to learn more about some of the chapters that aren't covered in the presentations, then get yourself over to Routledge and pick yourself up a discounted coffee uh, copy. I think... Um, Simon, our editor at Routledge, said that the 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 number in the discount code just changes depending on the year. So if you're wanting to pick up a copy next year, then the code just changes to 23 rather than 22. Um, so in the short time that we've got to introduce the book today, um, so we, we're, Jack and I are going to introduce the book and then we'll pass over to Danny, Kev and Cass when he arrives. Um, we're just we're going to do three things, really. Um, between us. First, we'll just explain why we decided to write this collection or um, collate this collection in the first place. Um, then we'll provide a very brief sketch to the book's conceptual foundations. And then finally, we'd like to give you a sense of how, and maybe more importantly, why the contributions have been thematized and structured in the way that they have. So if we can begin with the why then, um, as some of you may or may not know, for the past probably four or five years now, um, Jack and myself have been writing on, on the topic of what might broadly be described as, as nature sport or green exercise, as it's often called. Um, and what we found is 
the longer that we've written about it and the more we've tried to establish some kind of kernel of truth regarding what nature is and uh, how it relates to activities such as, in our case, ultramarathon running, mountain biking, electric mountain biking, the more it's almost eluded our explanation and understanding. And over time, it's I think it's safe to say that we've concluded that there are three possible reasons for this. One is that um, maybe we're barking up the wrong tree, we're not doing it right, or we're coming at it from the wrong direction, which I'd hope it, it isn't. Um, two is that theories of nature now, which are, are evident in things like the emerging new materialist frameworks and the post-human turn, are moving at such a fast pace now that the very idea or concept of nature is increasingly difficult to pin down conceptually. And finally, it, it seems like, ontologically at least, that nature has largely dis disappeared from our purview, disappeared from everyday life. You know, in a world now where we're finding amalgams of plastic and rock and people are queuing to get to the top of Everest and we're, fly we're finding plant life um, that's actively adapted to avoiding human activity, this idea that we can find some kind of remote, natural, untouched wilderness that's free from human influence is is almost completely untenable now as we move towards this so-called um, era of the Anthropocene. So it's in this context that we've found sport and physical activities to be invaluable tools, really, in both disorientating and reorienting existing social and material relationships to the environment, um, in that they can provide both a useful sensing device that alerts people and participants to the complexities of things like environmental change, um, but they can also provide an opportunity to experiment with new frames of social, political and ecological reference. So uh, having come to this realization, then we started to look for ways of making sense of this connection and, for, uh, and, and publishing more in this area, as well as looking for other examples of where similar traumas might have um, been incurred. And, and naturally, the first place we started to look for answers was, was in the disaster literature. And there's some fantastic literature, some of which you might be familiar with by the likes of Holly Thorpe. Um, Clifton Evers does some really good work on disaster. Hazel Hartley's written a book on, on disaster and events. And all of this has helped us to make some initial connections there between human and natural disasters and sport and physical activity. But at the same time, between as we felt like both the level and the extent of disruption and trauma that's inflicted by contemporary manifestations of things like climate change, war, global poverty, misinformation, uh, and things like that, went way beyond or transcended traditional conceptualizations of disaster in a way that, um, uh, to our understanding, hadn't really been given too much credit in the existing literature. So for us then, catastrophes, there's something qualitatively different about a catastrophe. And this is where the collection comes in, really. So what we wanted to do was to bring together a number of um, cutting edge authors, three of whom we'll have with us today, um, who are writing on very different, but at the same time, interrelated catastrophes. But at the same time, via that work, asking what role sport and physical activity can have in um, in adapting to what we've ended up calling the end of the world. So in doing this, um, what the collection has done, hopefully, is, um, is it's explored both the cognitive and affective sensibilities that are used by individuals and communities to experiment with new social, cultural and political identities, as well as how these processes are adapted in these um, chaotic and um, catastrophic times. So at this point, I'll just hand you over to Jack, who's going to explain how we framed and conceptualize this idea of catastrophe. Uh, yeah, OK. Hello. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. Hello, everyone. So in the, in the collection itself, we, we try to approach uh, the, the sort of the notion of catastrophe under this idea that we are now living in the age of catastrophe and that this is one marked by a sense of precarity and insecurity, a position that posits a number of important questions regarding how we define and relate to catastrophe. Indeed, how does one attribute an earthquake or a pandemic to natural causes when such issues and the measures taken to mitigate their effects are so often linked with the excesses and ignorance of human behaviour? Equally, how can one speak of war as a national geopolitical issue when climate change is increasingly contributing to conflict regarding dwindling space and resources? 
In approaching these questions, we outline a number of important distinctions when defining catastrophe. So to do so, we begin by differentiating uh, between disaster and catastrophe, drawing upon conceptual differences that reveal a variety of sociological, psychological and political consequences that influence how we anticipate, cope with and recover from traumatic events. Indeed, for us, one major distinction between disaster and catastrophe is the fact that disasters can be prepared for, albeit not without difficulty. Indeed, although the physical and material infrastructure of a disaster zone may be temporarily disrupted, the existing social fabric remains largely intact. By contrast, catastrophes are unprecedented and incalculable. They are larger in scale and more frequent in occurrence, surpassing any effort for preparedness. Based on this distinction, we can consider how the early 21st century has been marred by a seemingly endless stream of catastrophes that have played out on this scale. This has led John David Ebert to declare that catastrophes are now becoming something of a way of life for, uh, for us, a new norm. What seems to characterize this new norm, however, is that there is no return to normal. Lives and livelihoods are shattered, order is lost, and there is an overwhelming and unprecedented sense of pain, suffering and injustice. At present, the most notable example of this is in the staggering figures that illustrate the extent of our warming planet. In 2020, the Arctic reached a record-breaking temperature of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, leading to significant wildfires. Not long after, California recorded its highest ever temperature. These unprecedented figures in indicate that we are grappling with a series of climate catastrophes that vastly exceed our ability to control them. On this basis, catastrophes can be said to introduce a rupture that interrupts our everyday life. This is another key point of difference in relation to disaster. While disasters incur momentary changes in local conditions, catastrophes such as climate change, war, poverty and terrorism may leave us feeling deeply and perpetually unsettled. The temporality of catastrophe is also markedly different to that of disaster in that it is slow, protracted and difficult to comprehend through human frames of reference. Nuclear waste, climate change and ecocide do not simply go away with time, but provide present reminders of previous activity and future effects that may have unimaginable impacts on people to come. Here, the long-term effects of the Chernobyl disaster and the residual nuclear waste goes beyond any temporal reference with the uranium half-life constituting 4.5 billion years, which I think is, is actually is sort of the, the age of Earth. Consequently, due to their size and temporal significance, catastrophes are neither here in the sense that they are directly lived and experienced, nor there in that you can encapsulate the totality of their effects. Instead, catastrophes are what Elizabeth Bolton refers to as hyper threats. They expose both the inadequacy of existing geopolitical arrangements and frames of reference that have no firm locality or epistemological precedent. Ultimately, when taken together, we believe that these characteristics suggest that catastrophes have an air of what Mark Fisher has referred to as the weird and the eerie. First off, contrary to the subjective qualities of trauma, emotion and vulnerability, catastrophes are weird in that they introduce two or more things, such as nature and culture, which do not sit comfortably together in the same space. Here we are left with an un unnerving sense that something is wrong, that certain objects or entities should not exist as they do, which ultimately compels us to consider whether our current way of thinking might be adequate. We feel this when a major tennis tournament is cancelled due to poor air quality, or when we cannot ski because there is no snow on the, no snow on the mountain. It may also serve us in the guilt that we may feel when watching an extravagant sport event, such as the Indian Grand Prix or Rio, Olymp or Rio uh, Olympics, which take place a stone's throw away from poverty stricken, stricken slums and favelas. Within these moments, there is a sense of intrigue that opens us up to potential new worlds, as well as positing new questions about our future. In such cases, what would normally appear less significant on an ontological level is suddenly and often violently brought into focus. This can be traumatizing as we seek to comprehend and generate meaning from these realizations. In contrast, the eerie is marked not by a feeling of presence, but rather by a feeling of absence, a failure of absence or a failure of presence. Catastrophic spaces have this eerie effect when there is something present where there should be nothing, or there is nothing present when there should be something. Over the last few decades, we have seen this in the widely popularized and shameful images of the dilapidated Olympic facilities in places such as Athens and Montreal, which have been left to rot once the games are finished. These facilities, once so full of life, stand as monuments to the lies and ideologies that inform much of the rhetoric around the legacy of the Olympic Games. 
a sense that is further compounded by the economic, social and political struggles that countries often suffer in the wake of mega events. We also witnessed the eerie when sports are over-engineered to take place in environments that would otherwise be teeming with ecological diversity, such as golf courses. Though on the surface, these sites may appeal to an ideological nature aesthetic, they have been shown to have an extremely harmful impact on human and non-human health due to heavy pesticide use, artificial methods of irrigation, and the forced appropriation of native land. Together, we believe that tuning to the weird and the eerie demands new ways of thinking that go beyond what we know about catastrophe in order to recalibrate our beliefs and minds to thrive in an era without precedent. Indeed, catastrophes cannot be governed or managed in orthodox terms and require global interplanetary solutions that recognize the densely entangled and temporal connections between human beings and other forms of symbiotic life. As a result, catastrophes temporarily force, force us to project ourselves and our behaviors into the future in order to affect change in the present. To do this, however, we need to recognize those instances of the weird and the eerie that affect us in our everyday lives. Effects that can allow us to remain open to those instances where catastrophe requires us to be vulnerable to others, to be transformed by alien and unpredictable encounters, and to be thrown into shifting relationships that remake both the world and ourselves. As evident in the way that we have structured the collection, which Jim's now going to introduce, we argue that the first most important step in this process is to recognize that despite catastrophe, life as we know it, life as we know it has already come to an end. Right, so clearly the, the scale, as Jack mentioned there, the scale, temporality and the ontological securities that are brought about by catastrophe raise complex, almost metaphysical questions regarding the future of humanity. But for Jack and I, its implications are, are, are relatively straightforward, and that is that we've witnessed, as Jack mentioned there, we, we've witnessed the end of the world as we, as we once knew it. So obviously we're not saying that the world has literally come to an end because obviously it, it hasn't but what we we are saying is that now traditional notions of the world don't really work anymore um and it's it's the various catastrophes um represented in this book and as you'll see on the screen here that help for for better or for worse to bring about the world's demise now although this might seem overly pessimistic or, or dramatic or negative Jack and I genuinely see optimism in this way of thinking because it's grounded in the idea that catastrophes have an ontological significance um, or, as it were, that they reveal a condition from which any sense of wholeness or harmony is neither apparent nor desired. So for us to designate the end or the ends of the world is to recognise those catastrophic events, again, like the ones you see on the screen here, that can't be symbolized or represented within the current social order. And therefore, um, there's a need there to understand, perhaps through sport and physical activity, why this might be. So with this in mind, then, um, what uh, we hope to have done in this editor collection and what um, the contributors to this book, like um, Kev, Danny and, and Cass and Tom, who's on the call today as well, Tom Critchley, have helped to elucidate is how physical activity can, as I mentioned earlier, serve as both a sensing device that alerts us to, to um, that alerts participants to the complexities of environmental change, but also and often at the same time provides an opportunity to experiment with new frames of social, political and ecological reference. So in order to do this, we've organized the chapters um, according to the various manifestations of the end that we feel are most prominent in contemporary uh, societies and in contemporary accounts of, um, of the end of the world. So in, in part one, which we've titled, as you'll see on the top left there, which we've titled The End of Capitalism, each of these chapters in Guy engages with Kai Heron's um, provocation that it appears in many ways that, that capitalism is at least beginning to start to fray at the edges. So as you'll see from that list of contents there, um, we've got some fantastic chapters by um, Tom Critchley, again, who's on the call on uh, post-capitalist practice in, in skateboarding. We've got a chapter there on sport for development and post-colonial residue, um, as well as a chapter on the use of sport with indigenous populations who have been affected by resource extraction, all of which demonstrate, we feel, some debate about whether capitalism has come to an end. In the second part, which is uh, top right of the screen there, which we've termed the end of the social, 
chapters are oriented around what has variously been described as uh, the death of public man which of course is Richard Sennett's term or a culture of narcissism which is uh, Lash's notion which uh, taken together um, seek to expose how real forms of sociality and democracy are increasingly jeopardized by um, what might be described as the automated algorithmic or rationalizing tendencies of late modern consumer societies. So in this section, which for obvious reasons um, focuses almost exclusively on the COVID-19 pandemic, we've got chapters on um, the regulation of physical activity norms by uh, Holly Collins and Randall and Stanley Windsor. Uh, we've got chapters on um, community resilience through outdoor walking groups by Dan Bates and Ginny and Partington. Um, political activism in the WNBA by Georgia Monroe, Monroe Cook, and finally the um, governance of sport in Montenegro by Marco Begovic. In part three, but in the bottom left there, the end of nature, we've called that section, um, attention turns to uh, the unprecedented, uh, unprecedented developments in the past few millennia, as I mentioned earlier, that have um, completely altered the lived and geologic qualities of Earth. So chapters in this, this section, as you'll see, um, explore both the opportunities and dangers afforded by sport and physical activity practices, as it were, after nature or beyond nature. So um, I've written a chapter to begin that section on mountain biking as a way of sensing the end of nature and coping with it. Um, Kevin's chapter, which will be presented later, is on urban exploration in the midst of a, a natural catastrophe in New Zealand. Um, and there's a chapter there by uh, Jennifer Aman and, and Mark Deutsch, which uh, closes off that section on football fans and climate change. And then finally, in part four, um, which we titled end, The End of Morality, uh, which includes chapters by um, Cass and Danny, who are going to be presenting later on today, as well as Dean Rev uh, Revisa, um, explore what can... Uh, broadly be described as the kind of moral blindness uh, blindness to use Zygmunt Bauman's terms that accompanies the instrumentalization rationalization and massification of sport and physical cultures so in presenting their work they highlight the benefits uh, of sport and physical activity in pre preventing and resisting these practices but also how sport can also challenge um, or disrupt our sense of morality and our obligation to others so um, throughout the book, generally speaking, a, a great deal of emphasis has been placed um, by ourselves and by the authors on working together and intersectionally to, to examine a number of portrayals of catastrophe from lots of different directions, uh, as well as the people and places behind them. Um, we're also fortunate to have included a number of globally diverse and contextually rich case studies from places like Cameroon, the UK, Montenegro, New Zealand, America, Canada, um, Uganda, Jamaica and Palestine. And all of these taken together, we feel, um, do a really good job of illuminating both the scale and the reach of, of these issues. So in, in moving between the conceptual framing of catastrophe, sort of natural capitalist, social and moral catastrophes on the one hand, and the the really lucid kind of empirical depiction in some cases of specific real world examples on the other we really feel that like the book has been able to both zoom in on the physical emotional and effective aspects of catastrophe on the micro and, and local level whilst also and often at the same time in many cases zooming out to establish their links with global trends and collective practices so um presented in this way what we hope to have done um, in putting this book together is to provide a glimpse of a new paradigmatic approach to catastrophe, whilst also um, demonstrating how sport and physical activity might help us all to live and to die at the end of the world. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, I suppose on that note now, we can now turn to our three presenters. Uh, we're going to be presenting their chapters obviously drawn from the collection uh, which you can see in front of you there um so we'll go with uh, we're going to go with danny uh, alba Hawa, uh, first off so i'll just stop sharing my screen um and then i'll introduce you danny um okay so that stops shared now i think you've got the rights to to upload your slides or the capacity to do so
Okay, fantastic. So while those slides are just uploading, obviously, guys, if you do have any questions um, during the presentation, we're going to save all the questions for the at the end of the presentation. So we'll have Danny, we'll go with Kev, and then we'll finish up with Cass. Um, so all questions can be directed to them at the end uh, at the end of the session. If you do have a question though during the talk, please by all means uh, put them in the chat um, where I'll be able to sort of uh, draw upon them uh, during the question time. Um, but thank you very much. I think we can uh, now see your slides, Danny. So, uh, so Danny is a lecturer in contemporary applied performance at the University of Leeds and an ambassador for skateboarding charity Skate uh, Paland and a co-director of Skate Manager of uh, Skate Manchester. Sorry. She is currently a co-I on a Leather Hume Trust funded research project exploring the experiences of women and girls skateboarders within Northern English skate parks and public urban spaces. Danny's going to be presenting her chapter today, Participant Centered Skateboarding in the West Bank, Occupy Palestine, an analysis of the work of Skate Pal. So over to you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, so, yeah. Uh, Thank you for the introduction. I don't have to do that <laughs> now. Um, okay. Um, so um, actually, one thing I did want to say before I move on to my slides, aside from that introduction, is I wanted to just um, highlight my positionality in relation to this topic. So I'm a British Palestinian researcher and artist, and I was born and brought up in the UK. So I have a um, a heritage connection to Palestine through my dad and um, and I'm also a skateboarder so I, I started skateboarding when I was an adolescent and, um, and those two things really brought, drew me to work with to the work with skate pal in this particular part of the world. Um, so my chapter um, engages first of all with what I perceive to be sector challenges for skateboarding charities so there's um, in in recent years there's been an increasing number of skateboard charities operating within within areas of war and protracted conflict. Um, these include charities such as Skate Pal, who I'm going to be talking about, uh, Skate Aid, um, who are a German organisation that work across <clears throat> different countries, uh, Free Movement Skateboarding, who are predominantly based in Athens. Uh, Concrete Jungle Foundation and Tom is here as well on the call who works um, with Concrete Jungle Foundation so uh, that's great. Um, Girl Skate India and many more all of whom are engaged in activity that is related to sport for development and peace um, within that kind of field. So within social skateboarding projects there there's quite a lot of differentiation of practice um, some organisations will use skateboarding to elaborate a curriculum in, for example, entrepreneurial skills or English language or graphic design. Um, uh, an example of this is Skate Kelia, who are based in the West Bank. Um, and then also Concrete Jungle Foundation, and there's a picture here on their slide from their website, um, launched what they call an Educate programme which introduces skateboarding participants to discussion and learning about positive psychological educational skills such as respect, confidence, courage and creativity. So you've got those kind of practices on one hand and then at the opposite end of this range there are organisations who've built who build skate parks without operating a volunteer programme of any kind um, such that the park and the communities in which they're located are often left without the support to enable participation and without the knowledge and resources to make any needed repairs to the skate park. So there's quite a broad range of things going on within this sector. And there's an, a need to understand what best practice looks like across those sorts of projects. And um, one of the things I was interested in highlighting through my research was how geographically and politically specific that practice is. Um, and then, uh, and then there's also some academic and research challenges that are related to this. So um, there's, a, there's a sense that there's a lack of evidence of outcomes from within the sports development and peace sector generally. Um, Thorpe and Reinhardt highlight how uh, researchers examining the social impacts of action sports tend to oversimplify, decontextualize and romanticize the relationship between action sports participation and activism 
Um, additionally, there has been a problem historically in SDB context with researchers adopting a deficit model um, when understanding the benefits of impacts and interventions. And by this, I mean that communities are too readily regarded as lacking certain skills and expertise, either through the ignorance of researchers or their blindness to expertise that sit outside of a Western European epistemological framework. Um, and then there's also uh, calls from Dana and Hayhurst who articulate a critical crossroads for the discipline, writing that significant work remains to be done to move towards decolonizing um, sports as a tool for development and the SDP movement. Um, so this was the starting point, these were the starting points really for my research and having experience with skate power, I thought that the charity's approach offered something interesting to these debates and issues. So a little bit about skate pal then. Uh, the name skate pal stands for skate Palestine. <clears throat> the charity was started by Scottish skateboarder Charlie Davis, um, who is pictured in many of these photographs. Um, and he visited the West Bank in 2006, um, teaching to go and teach English. Um, he took his skateboard with him on the trip and local children were really interested in what he was doing and wanted to have a go. Um, so he, Charlie returned from his first trip to the West Bank and um, enrolled on a master's degree in Arabic. Um, he continued to visit Palestine over the next few years and he had some ideas to bring friends with him um, and uh, um, built a skateboarding ramp in Ramallah for some of the families that he'd kind of connected to, to use. And then this sort of idea developed over time. And in 2013, he registered the charity and began making more links with different communities uh, to collaborate on different play spaces. So it was something that really built up over a long time of Charlie becoming quite interested in this part of the world and uh, sort of really wanting to invest in it. Um, so Skate Pal have built two large skate parks um, alongside various other projects as well. Um, and they've also, uh, so the, the picture in the large picture in the middle, I just realized this, this slide is really difficult for me to actually direct you to different <laughs> images. Um, but the, the two large parks, the one at the bottom is um, in Jeyus, which is in the north of the West Bank. And that was built in collaboration with Skate Kilia. And the one at the, above that, at the top, that's the Rosa Skate Park in Asira Shamalia, which is very close to Nablus in the West Bank. Um, and then there's another large skate park that was built bottom left corner, and that's in Zabadde, which is uh, also in the north of the West Bank, actually. Um, so the um, yeah, so the so they're also skate pal are also currently working on a new project in Ramallah at the Inash Al Usra Girls Orphanage, and I've just put a little picture relating to that at the bottom right um, there. So and that's in uh, Albira Ramallah. Um, so yeah, various, various projects. Um, in terms of their approach though, Skate Pal don't operate a curriculum. So they build skate parks, they provide skateboards and they facilitate international skateboarder volunteers to come to the West Bank for between one and three months usually uh, to spend time at skate park and within the local community. The volunteers don't coach skateboarding in a formalized way, but they do teach basic skills to um, children and adults at the park. And um, Skate Pal have a local manager, Aram Sabah, uh, who takes care of the park and um, regular upkeep of the ramps is ensured on an annual basis. So Skate Pal um, focuses on supporting Palestinians in the West Bank rather than on any kind of bridge building project um, between Palestine and Israel. Uh, so in doing this, Skate Pal enacts um, what is what I argue in my chapter, a form of solidarity through being with Palestinian communities and by inviting skateboarders to visit, which subtly challenges the political architectures of separation uh, that are manifested in Israel's separation war. And that brings me to um, explain a little bit about how this chapter fits into the um, this section in particular. Um, so this book's emphasis on 
catastrophe is highly relevant to a discussion of the political context around the Israeli settler colonial project, which was inaugurated in 1948 by the establishment of the state of Israel as a result of the political concept of Zionism. So in 1948, approximately 700,000 Palestinians were expelled or displaced from their homes in what became Israel. And the events of 1948 and the ensuing destruction of Palestinian society over the past 70 plus years is often articulated through the Arabic phrase al-Nakwa, which means the disaster or the catastrophe. Uh, many Western and Middle Eastern nations are implicated in this, in the perpetuation of this catastrophe, but particularly the United Kingdom and the United States. And the initial catastrophe became chronic as Palestinians live in a now in a constant um, state of fear of violence and displacement. Most adults and children in the West Bank have directly experienced traumatic events, whether from arrests, armed conflict, home demolitions, etc. And Palestinians are subject to severe restrictions of movement, both within the West Bank and internationally. Um, so with this research, I wanted to um, explore how um, skate pal skateboarding projects operated within this context. The uh, municipality of Asira Ashamalia, where the, in the West Bank, which is this, where this skate park, the Rosa Skate Park is located, have collaborated with SkatePal since 2015. And I wanted to learn from speaking with people in the local community, what they thought about the skate park and about skateboarding. So with the help of, inter of an interpreter, my Arabic is very ropey. I interviewed people at the skate park with an explorative approach, asking open questions. I asked about participants' families, perceptions of skateboarding, about the benefits of the skate park and of skateboarding. And I asked questions about gender relationships as well. And all of these were key themes that I'd identified from my observations of the skate park during annual visits, which I'd made since 2015. And I'd like to highlight in this presentation some of the responses I received here. So um, first of all, uh, one area was around personal and social relationships. So several participants um, spoke about ways that skateboarding activity had relevance beyond the skate park itself. For example, an adult woman explained how skateboarding practice develops determination and resilience. So she said, the skater tries for the first time and the second time and the third time until he achieves what he wanted to do. To him, nothing becomes difficult and not just in playing this sport. In the future, whenever he faces a difficulty, he will overcome it. This sport helped the skater develop intellectual skills and gave them determination. Another participant highlighted um, the problem of troublemaking prior to the skate park being built and suggested that the skate park helps to channel energy towards a more positive pursuit. So this adult man stated that schoolboys would just make noise in the neighborhoods, uh, fighting with each other, annoying people, disturbing people. And when they started to come to the skate park, there was quiet in the neighborhoods. Kids, they came, they learned something um, that supports their feelings, supports their attitudes towards a better life. And this same participant passionately explained that their opinion of changes, particularly in young men within the community, were corroborated by the headmaster and teachers at the boys' school. So he explained, I asked the headmasters of the school, the teachers, about the kids, and they say that it's a really amazing thing. You know, the kids started to change. All the kids, they come, they spend some time, and they started to express themselves much better than before. They are more open than before. They are stronger than before and they are willing to do lots of things like voluntary things towards the school and towards other people. This is something very interesting that comes from the skate park. As a like standalone comment, this does indicate the potential for the skate park to offer a focused activity for young people that encourages self-expression, openness and cooperative social frameworks. And I think it's something that would be beneficial to further explore and really validate um, within the wider community. Um, another aspect that was really interesting that came from the research was about skateboarding uh, as a, a decolonial practice. So um, the, the participant I mentioned earlier saw the, what was happening in the skate park as being a political as much as a personal aspect of the skate park. So he explained, here you can decide your strategy for your life for one day 
without thinking about permissions from the Israeli authorities, without thinking about checkpoints, without thinking about incursions and other things, that people are focusing on them gives them the feeling that they are doing something good and people really admiring you. And this thing that I urge them to do more and more positive for themselves and for their society. So the skate park provides an activity that sits outside of the restrictions of everyday life in the West Bank. Um, ethnomusicologist and gender researcher David McDonald highlights how Palestinian self-determination can be claimed through the discourse of human rights and in particular forms of decolonization of the body. And this response from a research participant I felt really articulated that well, how that can work through skateboarding practice. Given the persistence of um, architectures of, and processes of restriction by the Israeli government, here the practice of participating in a creative transnational physical culture is understood as a form of decolonial action. Um, another aspect was the skate park as an international space. So this is a uh, really um, relevant socially and politically. When asked about what skate pal volunteers, what uh, participants enjoyed about skate pal volunteers coming to the skate park, one person said making new friends. And the political situation in the West Bank means that Palestinian, Palestinians are not easily able to travel outside of the region. The informal social relationships that are facilitated through interactions between local people and volunteers are not part of the work of SkatePal. But in the interview material that I that I gathered, um, the, these kinds of um, interactions were really seen as beneficial um, and a benefit of the skate park and as part of anti-colonial action. Um, if Palestinians struggle to travel, the next best thing is for people to visit effectively um and then there was a whole a whole lot of work around gender politics so palestinian society operates as with much of the world around a model of gender dichotomy and there's much discussion about the appropriateness of a mixed gender setting so that's uh, boys and girls or men and women participating together in the skate park so some of the questions asked were oriented towards participants opinions about gender mixing many of the younger participants were really positive about this um but it's apparent from um, from being at the skate park that most of the participants are under the age of 13 and typically it's acceptable for girls and boys in Palestine to play together until they reach puberty at which time there tends to be more social pressure for girls and boys not to mix in that way. Um, this is because there's a sort of worry about embarrassment of potential gossip about appropriate gender-based interactions that might occur within a particular locale. And during the first year skate power were working in Asira and during the building of the, the Asira Ashamalia skate park, skateboarding sessions for girls were initiated at the girls school, which is the picture you can see here on this slide. And the intention was that that might encourage some of those girls to attend the skate park once it was built. But the following year when I was there, my observations of, of the girls attending the skate park suggested that very few, if any of these girls were still using, when using the skate park. And so I asked the head teacher about this of the girls' school. And, um, and she said, first, the park is a little far away from the girls' homes. So when the girl is ready to go there after finishing her homework, by the time she gets there, it will be dark. Second, in vacations, girls tend to get busy with all these social events, such as weddings and parties, and don't have the time to train skating. Third, most families are against mixing the two genders in the park, and so they don't send their girls there. The necessity for separately gendered spaces exists across international contexts for different reasons, but what is known within Western interventions is that creating separate spaces for women and girls who use skate parks increases participation and provides spaces of community support. Although it is really important to consider the politics of this kind of separatist approach to solving the issue, because it doesn't really challenge the existing social framework. So, <clears throat> But any interruption to this particular existing social framework in Palestine would really be most appropriately initiated by the actors within the local context, rather than through the work of skate power as an international charity. It just, it just wouldn't be appropriate to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so, um, so the conclusions that I drew across this chapter were, first of all, 
that personal and interpersonal benefits perceived by participants of skateboarding were often measured against the capacity to overcome the restrictions imposed by the occupation or as a form of decolonizing the mind or body. Um, these responses highlight how much the politics of occupation interrupt and condition all aspects of life for Palestinians. Um, the presence of international volunteers, which could be seen as quite a colonial form of practice in, in a lot of contexts, in this context is seen as a mitigation for Palestinian people's restricted movement. And I thought that was quite interesting. So there's a need to kind of uh, continue encouraging and facilitating these kinds of international exchanges, even if the local skateboarding scene becomes self-sufficient. In terms of gender politics within the skate park, there's a need to respect local customs, of course, but also to provide a space that's as open and democratic as possible. Gender inclusivity is difficult to achieve in this context in an open public skate park where you can't control who comes and goes. Um, an interesting finding is that focused creative physical activity, such as skateboarding, may help to control or mitigate, <coughs> excuse me, uh, mitigate antisocial behaviour. The perceived increase in self-expression, openness and cooperation that has come from skateboarding activity is therefore a very positive result and something that should be explored in more depth, I think, not just um, in this context, but um, more widely as part of skateboarding studies. And finally, skateboarding's work, dem sorry, Skate Pal's work demonstrates how a community focused and, and more participant centered approach to um, researching skateboarding projects in catastrophic or the or even the practice of skateboarding projects in catastrophic environments can engender a deeper engagement with wider political effects whilst uncovering areas for supporting emergent develop development needs. Uh, without kind of imposing those from on the outset externally so that's that's it thank you very much for listening no thank you very much Danny. that was that's fantastic thank you um so as i said before if you've got any questions um save them to the end uh, or if not put it in the chat uh, so we can come back to it at the end uh, i'm now going to pass over to kevin bingham um if you share your screen i think you've got the capacity to do so kevin And as uh, Kevin's just switching over his screen there, I'll ring out, I'll read out his uh, short bio here. Uh, Kev is a higher education lecturer at Barnsley College. His research interests, which are centered around forms of leisure such as urban exploration, and more recently caving, are examined through the lens of liquid modernity. As an ethnographer, he is interested in understanding how social spaces are formed and experienced in the 21st century within sites and locations that are far removed from what we might which is titled an urban explorers experiences of meshwork melding and the uncanny invisible cities of the rubble so thank you very much kev i'll now pass over to you cheers thanks thanks for the introduction jack um can you all see my screen I, you i can't see any of yous anymore yes yeah we can yeah, see perfect oh, great stuff and um, so thanks jack for the introduction um i'll just get straight onto it then um i define a lot of these terms like urban exploration and meshwork and melding as we continue so i won't introduce them at this stage um so we'll just get cracking so this whole chapter really is about um part of the project that i worked on when i was working towards my doctorate um i did kind of it was more of a side project i suppose so um, I, I got offered a scholarship ultimately to go off and investigate this thing called Urbex um, and that was largely based in the UK but I did some research in New Zealand and I'll explain that as I get further into it but um, urban exploration itself then so just to quickly define it just just in case anyone hasn't heard of it before um, if it's a new term it's generally understood as the exploration of kind of abandoned buildings and um, normally human-made structures environments um, Typically, when people get into it when the first start, it's normally you know an abandoned building, might be a, a ruin, um, just you know maybe a social club, maybe an old pub, something along those lines. But it has got quite a comprehensive term. There's lots of different subcategories, I suppose. So it also includes things like climbing cranes in the middle of the night, and um, going into sewers, into drains, 
um, all, all kinds of different um, roof topping as well. And um, so all kinds of different elements. But I think key with the thing that knits them all together is that it's generally, uh, as I say, human made structures and environments. So this was the focus, as I say, of my, of my PhD. That's what I um, went off to investigate. Um, but my, my travels took me to New Zealand as well. So to get into that a little bit then, the beginning, I got offered a scholarship um, in New Zealand and this was to go off and um, do a little bit of research around urbex. My study was largely based in the UK, so I followed a group around for about four years and spent lots of time with them, got to know them uh, very well. And that's that's ultimately all that project's about. On the side, when I went over to New Zealand, though, um, I met another group over there, so I, I arrived, got, got in touch with them, um, and we regularly met up across all sorts of places in New Zealand to go off and explore abandoned places, really. Um, so that was the, the little side thing. That's ultimately what this chapter is about. Okay. So I think when people think of New Zealand, what they've got in the mind is kind of Middle Earth, um, of, often, you know, like Lord of the Rings, that kind of stuff. Um, and there are, the scenery over there is absolutely fantastic. If anyone's been up to the top part of Scotland, particularly over on the West Coast, it's very similar to that kind of terrain. Um, and I think that's the first thing people do think of when you go to New Zealand. And certainly in my own experiences, traveling around to get to lots of these abandoned sites, you had to drive through different mountain ranges, you had to drive through um, all kinds of spectacular scenes and it was fantastic. Um, but that's only a, a fraction of what New Zealand actually is like. Um, the other side of it is, um, this side of it. So what happened in New Zealand is, and most people have probably come across news articles around it, um, are the earthquakes. So it's on a couple of major fault lines, um, as not just in New Zealand, but I think it affects Australia and other local pl places within that region. Um, and particularly in the uh, 2011, um, 2012, some major earthquakes hit um, quite close to the Christchurch region. So they did catastrophic damage to the city of Christchurch itself and also lots of the surrounding towns and the, the local areas. The, 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 um, the quake was actually felt on both islands, even though it occurred on the South Island. So there was still damage done on the North Island as well. So it shows the, the sheer scale of it, really. But with the earthquake being so close to Christchurch, I think it was only about 15 miles out from where the city was. It, as I say, it caused catastrophic um, devastation, really. Um, and that really encapsulates really that the catastrophe that, that took place. Um, so a couple of images, that, that was obviously an image um, of as it happened, the earthquake. Um, and then you can see with one of the cathedrals uh, the, the impact it did have. So this is the other side of New Zealand that we started to explore these earthquake zones. So we were focused specifically on the red zoned areas. So these are the zones that are no longer deemed habitable. Um, a lot were built on sandy bases, and when the earthquakes happened, it meant the sand beneath the surface um, almost turned to liquid, which made the buildings sink into them. And um, you can see the result um, on many of the, the old buildings there, particularly the old historic buildings that weren't built to withstand earthquakes, um, stuff that was built in the, uh, the latter end of the 1800s, for example. So we went across um, and we spent a lot of time really in uh, Christchurch, going back and forth, multiple trips to go off and investigate this abandoned city, really. Um, when when I first arrived, it was a city that was like no other had experienced. So we arrived in the middle of the night um, by the airport. The airport was pretty normal, pretty standard. But when we got into the city, there were no people around, there were no cars. Um, it was almost like being in a war zone in many ways. There were bits of buildings still across the streets. Um, and like I said, there was, there was no one milling around, no, no cars on the roads. It was a very surreal experience. Um, and it also meant that you could access all of these buildings as well. Although there were sort of fences and bits and pieces up, a lot of them had just been left and they were falling down. And, and a lot of work hadn't really taken place to build, rebuild the city at this stage. It was very much a disaster zone. So we decided we'd go off and investigate this place. It's almost like a giant playground that you can go off and, uh, and explore. So that's a little bit about the, the city, the New Zealand and the sort of areas that um, I focused on. So the purpose of the chapter then, uh, this within the book, is really to um, change the idea of catastrophe into something that's a little bit more um, about imagination, a little bit more about our own ideas and how we invent forms of leisure in strange places. And I think 
particularly when we're dealing with things like catastrophe, uh, catastrophe um, often we have quite a negative thought and idea around that, um, particularly Christchurch, for instance, because people did die in those earthquakes and a lot of people injured. Um, countless people lost their homes, their, their livelihoods as well. So it's certainly not a pleasant thing. But rather than write about that side of things, I wanted to write a little bit about um, the other opportunities that emerge through engaging with these places and through exploring them. Um, so really, like I say, I'm trying to look at the enchantment side of things. So how people can make memories in these places, perhaps express different desires, um, perhaps escape just the general day to day norms and um, using these places of catastrophe to do that, really. OK, so that's the purpose of the, the, the chapter all in all. So. What the chapter was inspired by really was a book by Italo Calvino um, and he wrote a book called Invisible Cities and it's considered an anti-novel so it was written in a particular style and structure that's supposed to be quite mathematical if you look into the contents page it's very structured very ordered but then when you get into the book itself what it is really it's um, 55 different fictitious cities um, from the perspective of the traveller who's exploring them. So he uses Marco Polo as the traveller um, who's visited these places, he's reporting on them, um, and he's telling Kublai Khan who, who all of these cities are allegedly in his empire, and he's telling them all about them and um, sharing the stories of his travels. And that's what Kublai Khan wants to learn from this. Um, but really what Calvino's book is, it's not structured, and it's not logical as it gives the suggestion in that contents page. It's this kind of, as I say, anti-structure. It's full of all these different absurd absurdities and um, misinformation in many ways. Um, and Kublai Khan, as he's listening to Marco Polo, knows this. He knows that some of these stories are fictitious. He knows that there's not always full truths in there, although there are elements of truth in it. Um, and and and. Ultimately, that's what inspired, I think, um, this chapter, ultimately. So that's what I wanted to write a little bit about um, and take that idea. So following that same style, what I thought I would do is think a little bit about my own experiences while I was there and some of the buildings and the places that we explored and visited, because certainly the places that, um, that we managed to get into no longer served the original functions or purposes anymore. Some of them weren't even definable um, in terms of that original function either. Um, so what they were beginning to be defined by is what we made of them, really, what we turned them into for the purposes of leisure, ultimately. Um, so, And obviously, these are born through catastrophe. So that's how they arose. That's how they've, they've been created. Um, so what I wanted to investigate was what are these, when we might call them invisible cities within Christchurch, what are these invisible cities that we, we explored? And that's basically what the rest of the, the remainder of the chapter is about. So I can go through and tell you a little bit about those, really. So the journey began, as I said a little bit earlier, right to begin uh, the, the, the presentation. Our journey began in Christchurch. We arrived in the middle of the night. Um, so this was one of many trips. So we'd already been there before. Um, this was just another one of those. We tended to travel by the last flight across there because it was cheaper. So we'd get across there and accommodation was never a problem because we'd seek out accommodation within the abandoned city. We would just find an abandoned apartment or we'd find um, maybe an old hotel or something like that. And we just make use of that. So we'd make use of, of the city around us. So like most of the other trips, this particular journey that the chapter is based on, we arrived into Christchurch quite late, as I say, and then decided to go around, take some more photographs visit some places that we hadn't yet been into. Um, so these are a couple of the places, for instance, um, got a little cafe, um, some Korean restaurant, um, which led into other buildings and bits and pieces as well, uh, a little bit maze-like. So that's where we began. And what we were looking for um, in particular, uh, in amongst looking at those um, bits and pieces was the Audion Theatre. So this is quite an old building that was built in 1880, um, if I recall that right. Um, and this building had been there a couple of weeks earlier um, and we were trying our best to find this thing um, and we couldn't for some reason it disappeared um, a little bit like that's how Christchurch was so you'd go one week um, and it'd be a certain way there'd be certain routes there'd be certain pathways but the next week you'd turn up and it would be completely different um, and you'd be, get lost you couldn't find things that you'd found previously um, and we were baffled so we were stood on the street that we were certain it used to be on and there was no evidence that used to be there. And um, there was actually some of the big um, tin can structures, what you call them, um, like shipping crates um, in place as we realized the next day. 
um, but it's a bit, little bit confusing in the night. Um, and only a few weeks earlier, we'd managed to climb into it. And that's an image of the Audion Theatre there. That's one I took the day after, um, the, the first time we, we got into it. Um, and this is not a building that you could enter in the conventional way. This is a, a building that we had to climb up that slope you can see uh, dead ahead. So it's had, um, in at this stage, it had its rear part removed. Um, so it meant you could climb up the rubble, up the slope, into the main kind of auditorium, whatever you want to call it, and um, get into where the seats were. And if you go through the two doors at the back, you could get into the rest of the theatre, which is full of um, marble staircases. It's full of um, big pillars. It was it's quite fancy in there, or it was. Um, and it was not, still not like a conventional building, though, because things like the staircase um, were destroyed, they were damaged. So it meant we had to treat the building in very, very different ways. Um, I know there's a lot of text on there. And basically, it's, it's what I'm going to tell you a little bit about now. It's that inside invisible cities uh, there's a city called Esmeralda um, and this is where it changes and it's adaptable and you don't follow it in the logical manner and this is very much what it was like being in this Audion theatre um, so going back to that marble staircase for instance it's not a staircase you could know anymore sort of walk up and down in a conventional way you had to walk on the outside so we had to climb up and down it um, and building the building itself didn't have a logical path you couldn't follow and the path to the toilet, for instance, because there was rubble in the way, there was bits and pieces to climb over and contend with. And in parts, for instance, you'd have to climb through the, the ceiling and through rafters and bits to reach other segments of the building. So it was very much about inventing your own path to get to these places and certainly not following any kind of like linear structure or um, the original means in which the building was designed to be um, sort of wandered through. Um, so what this invisible city out i'm really so as i sat down to write about it what this invisible city is all about really is this idea of meshwork i think um so this follows tim ingold's notion of meshwork uh, and suggests that um or what that what i suggest in the chapter is that when you find this invisible city what you're finding is a, a scene or a place where you can invent your own lines your own chaotic structures and um, your own experiences ultimately recycling reusing a place that originally had a structure but that's no longer visible it's no longer feasible either um so you're inventing it as you go through it um, and that that was very much the case from the moment of entering the building climbing up that slope and emerging into um this you know all of the rows of seats which is never a way i've entered a theater in the past before and then exploring the rest of it as well, the rest of the building, it was just treating that building in very much that meshwork kind of style. So that series of interwoven lines. Um, and the main point that Ingold makes inside when he writes about this is that um, the lines aren't ever experienced by other people in the same way. So if another group of urban explorers had gone in there the next day, for instance, the likelihood is they would experience something in a, in a very different way, their own unique experience of that. And that makes these meshwork experiences very, very special in many ways, because it means they're always different. They can't be relived, they can't be recycled. They're very much in the moment. Um, and the, the only way we can sort of report on those is to tell you about them as I'm doing now. Um, so that's the first sort of invisible city I think that I experienced, that's meshwork. And that was in the Audion Theatre. So the next one then, after experiencing the Audion Theatre, or trying to find it in the middle of the night and failing, we decided to, we'd stop there. We were going to go and find a place to sleep. Um, and it was starting to rain at this point as well. So it was getting a little bit stormy outside. So we thought, well, we'll get some sleep. We're here for a few days and we'll, we'll continue our exploring. So we found quite quickly an abandoned apartment since they're all abandoned. Um, and we decided we'd go for the penthouse, the top flat, um, and we were going to drink some beers up on the balcony. And that's us sat on the balcony drinking some beers. Um, and as we got up there, this this fierce storm started and there was thunder, there was lightning, there was, there was rain, it was, it was pretty grim out there. So we decided to just sit and watch. It was pretty spectacular. Um, and again, once, once I started to write this chapter, it made me think back to this experience because it was very much like one of the cities that Calvino describes um, called um, Thakela. Um, and this is a city that's always in transformation. So it's always been rebuilt and built and it's never completed. Um, so it means it's always full of towers and scaffolding, cranes, sort of devastation. And really, that's what sucked us in. And I think it was probably the thunderstorm at the time that we really made it spectacular because the city in front of us was it was in complete darkness. And um, so a lot of the lights out, the power wasn't working in the vast majority of these places. And um, so it really was just this chaotic scene in front of us. Um, and what 
that did though it made us think of the city in in starkly different ways and that's where this process of Melden took place so we sat there drinking our beers um, and it got us thinking about how this old city the old Christchurch was starting to meld into different versions or different forms of invisible cities essentially and there were three that really I can I can recall from sitting there that um, really stood out and the first I think is to do with uh, ruin beauty so this is the idea that once we get past uh, the catastrophe, so once something bad has happened, um, in time, we start to appreciate the ruins that are left over. Um, so although it was, you know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, devastating, it, had, um, it impacted many lives in many bad ways. When that kind of, if we want to put it in that way, it wears off, um, we can start to appreciate the ruins for something different. And that's certainly the way that we view things sat on the balcony, unaffected ourselves by the earthquake. So we could see a city in front of us starting to meld into something that was almost beautiful, almost um, had that artistic element to it. Um, and we were viewing it almost, if you if you went to Greece, for instance, if you went over to Athens and you can see the old ruins of the, the ancient city there, it was almost like a modern version of that um, right in front of our eyes. Obviously very different, just, just different styles of ruins, but still had that ruin beauty about it, which numerous scholars have written about. The other form of invisible city that we noticed was this idea of shared space. So obviously the city, the normal city around us, particularly over to the east side, um, had been largely created, crumbled. Some of it had been demolished and they turned into these, what they call brown spaces. Um, and lots of cities have them. It's where nature kind of starts to take back over um, and they start to look very green, but you can still see remnants of the rubble beneath them. And what we could see in these spaces was the shed space starting to meld and take place. And I don't just mean that by nature starting to take over. I mean that by the activities that were starting to take place in these areas. So some of them have been turned into little campsites, for instance. And um, so you'd see little pictures of tents and um, just over there um, in, in certain fields of rubble. You'd see some of them had been turned into parks. Some had been uh, turned into shared allotments. So for the few people that were still left in the city, some of them had been turned into communal spaces to, um, to, to grow vegetables, to regenerate the city in a different kind of way. Um, and other, other shared spaces, I think some of them had turned into a skateboard park, for instance. So they were using them for all these brown spaces for all kinds of melding into, into new cities, essentially new, new spaces of leisure. And the last one really um, is this kind of like, I suppose more of an imaginative performative style or side of things. So with us sat there on the balcony in this abandoned city, it started to very much feel like we were part of some apocalyptic future. And I think that's very much part of um, the melding that takes place. So you'll get lots of explorers. It became quite a trendy thing to do, um, particularly in the time as I got towards the end of my um, experience in New Zealand to go to Christchurch and experience this apocalyptic future because it very much felt like what you would expect to find in, in movies like, um, I'm trying to think of an example, um, things like where aliens have invaded and um, the earth's been destroyed, those kinds of games and films. It was very much like being interjected into one of those um, and you very much become part of that identity. It almost feels real even though you know that you're not in those games or in those movies. So that was another way that it starts to meld and become something else, something different. Um, and, and we enjoyed that for the evening. So the last one then. So the following day, um, we decided to go and take a little look around the city. And at this stage, we hadn't yet been into the main cathedral. So the main cathedral in the city centre, uh, the Anglican Cathedral. So this is right in the centre. This is perhaps um, the most, the, the busiest part of the city. And this place had a few people milling around it. So um, compared to the rest of the city, this, this part was a little bit busier. So we were a little bit nervous about getting in, about being caught, about being observed, uh, watched getting in. Um, but we decided to give it a go anyway since we were there. And I'd never been in an abandoned cathedral before. So it was this very spectacular building that we thought would be incredible to get inside. Um, we thought security was going to be intense with it being such a spectacular building. But in reality, we just walked through a wooden door at the back, um, the back entrance, really, um, and got in that way. So it wasn't that hard at all. Once we got inside, though, it, it changed the atmosphere. So I would say Urbex in general, it's very much um, it's very much fun. It's enjoyable. There's a lot of um, there's a carefree nature to it. But with uh, the cathedral itself, it was different. It was very different to everything I've ever explored. 
Um, we were inside this building that was spectacular and it's very rare to be inside an abandoned cathedral, I'd suggest. Um, and we could see the old stained glass windows still in place, some of them were cracked. We could see, um, you know, all of the ornate bits and pieces, the pulpit, for example, um, the organ, they're all still inside, but all in various states of decay. And um, so, and it still had that feeling of, um, that feeling that you get in any cathedral, really, that you walk inside and it felt spectacular. It felt um, immense, like uh, another power was there, um, whether you're religious or not. However, at the same time, there was also this kind of melancholic feel to the place. So, and it was really hard to shift. It was almost like it was on your shoulders the entire time. So normally, for instance, we'd go in a place and we'd, we'd play with the piano for a bit or we'd um, go and take some photographs onto the roof. And no matter what we did in this place, it, it just felt wrong. It felt a little bit like we shouldn't be there. It felt like we were in a place that shouldn't exist. Um, and this really started to get me th thinking a little bit about what, what is this? What, what am I experiencing here? Um, so as I started to write a little bit about it, I came across um, Sigmund Freud's um, essay on the uncanny, and I realised that that's probably what we're experiencing at that time. Um, and this is the idea or the argument that there's certain environments or certain places where great ontological struggles are set in motion, and um, particularly in a place like a cathedral that's partially destroyed, it's um, teetering on the verge of collapse. Um, this is a place that was obviously a divine place, but at the same time diabolic. It's not something we should ever see. Um, so it's shocking when we do see it. Um, to explain his idea, Sigmund Freud uses the idea of a doll. So he calls the, a normal child's doll an uncanny thing. Um, and we often find dolls like that quite scary, especially when the eyes open in the middle of the night or um, they just look a little bit, they make us feel a little bit disconcerted, I think. Um, and that's, that's Sigmund Freud's point. And that's the same with the cathedral. Um, it's like it's got this alien double that shouldn't exist and it turns something that is command and majestic into it um, and it makes us feel uncanny and familiar um, and I think at the heart of that is that these places still retain a sense of their own past so that those strong connections with its original past um, but then we're there for to experience it in a whole different purpose um, and that was a very um, that, that was a very powerful feeling that we got through being in there really. So that was the last city, the divine and the diabolic in Christchurch Cathedral, and um, that sense of the uncanny that we got instead. So very different to the other cities we'd encountered. So I'll just wrap up there, really. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for, for listening. No, fantastic. Um, thanks, Kevin. In incredibly interesting. Um, it was nice to have the photos there as well. I think obviously I'd read the chapter, but it was nice to have the images and actually see the bits that you'd, you'd been describing in your chapter. So that was that was nice to see. Um, so we've gone from uh, Palestine to New Zealand uh, now to the the sports science laboratory uh, with Cass Gibson. Um, so hello, Cass. Uh, are you okay? Do you want to? I, I think you've got the rights to to share your screen. Do you have slides or? No, no. I'm just talking. Thanks, Jack. Sorry about that. So uh, no, that's. Um, no, fantastic. That's fine. I'll just do your introduction and then I'll let you begin. So Cass Gibson is an associate professor at Plymouth Marjon University, where he teaches research methods, social theory and pedagogy. His research uses a range of sociological theories and research methodologies to understand experiences and practices in research, physical activity and public health. Uh, Cass is going to be presenting his chapter today, which is uh, titled Informational Hazards and Moral Harm sport and exercise science laboratories as sites of moral catastrophe. Okay, thank you very much, Cass. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, kia ora tato katoa. Hi, everyone. Um, I can see Joe Piggins in the room. He's a fellow New Zealander. And Kevin, that was a bit spooky for me. Um, kia ora. I, 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 Joe, I, um, I went to high school and did my undergraduate in Christchurch. My parents lived there. The Odeon Theatre in the early 2000s, I saw uh, Cypress Hill and and uh, Ben Ben Harper played there, not in the same same bill, but um, yeah. So it's put me through a wee bit of a loop. So um, I will try and regather myself and, and see how we go. But thanks, Kev. That was certainly um, uncanny for me, seeing some of those places and, and knowing what they were like uh, before the earthquake and then in in the period after and now through the rebuild. Whenever I can get back. So. Um, Thanks first to, to uh, Jack and Jim for putting the book together. I've got my copy here. It's a beautiful piece of work. Thank you. Um, and thanks to people for inviting. And, and I'm sorry that you wanted to hear me talk. Um, what I want to do in this session is just give a little bit of a background. At some point, if you've got nothing better to do, you'll um, end up reading the chapter. So I thought I'd give a background to where it came from. 
um, and then um, run through the main arguments and ideas so that you uh, can decide if you do ever feel the need to read it. So um, as in my bio there, part of my work is understanding uh, sport and exercise science as a project and variously that's drawn previously on quite standard uh, science and technology studies and um, quite modern social theory uh, given the way I've been understanding sport and exercise science is, is a highly modern project, uh, certainly initially. And the first exposure I had to thinking about it is anything other than um, a useful positivist experience was through my undergraduate degree in physical education when I first read John Marie Brougham's prison, uh, Sport, a Prison of Measured Time. And my favourite subject in my studies up until then was exercise physiology. And upon reading that, it was um, at the time I was also a fairly mediocre varsity athlete. Um, I was in a few representative squads and could identify that some of the practices that John Marie Brougham articulated so powerfully were happening to me. Um, and then for reasons unknown, the story we don't need here, I ended up uh, doing an ethnographic study nearly a decade later on sport and exercise scientists and spent time hanging out in an exercise physiology laboratory. And again, that was a fairly standard science and technology studies um, approach. But something I found um, consistently nagging at me um, through the analysis that I was producing and um, the, the work that I was doing was something I couldn't quite put my finger on the way that sport and exercise scientists approach the work that they do. And if any of you are located in, in fairly standard sport and exercise science faculties or schools, you, you'll come across these kind of ways of thinking. Um, and there were two real catalyst moments for me um, prior to starting this book is I was talking to a very senior professor in North America and they just finished a large study um, with a group of firefighters and it turned out that the exercise intervention that was supposed to limit or reduce or prevent uh, occupational injuries and harm for these firefighters showed that it didn't do anything and in the course of this conversation they um, the associate, uh, the professor said to me, but I'm not going to publish that. And so I asked him, well, why are you not going to publish that? I know that there's a real difficulty publishing um, in your world, non-significant findings. And they said, no, that's not it. Um, it probably would be publishable. It's just that I don't want people thinking exercise is not good for them. And so we had by their own standards um, and their own logics and their own value system, not me coming in with uh, social theory or quoting Brom or whoever at them, um, they decided that their project wasn't useful, wasn't defensible. So rather than actually being honest and open about that, um, that was something that was buried despite the work and effort that had gone into this rather large trial. The second um, key challenge was, um, and this does make it into the chapter briefly, although Jim did ask me to take it out. Um, <laughs> Uh, another very, very senior scientist who, um, if you did study physiology as part of a general sports science degree, um, you will have read their work in, in major textbooks for sure, um, was talking about their work in thermoregulatory physiology. And one of the key things that they were working on was how to keep um, human bodies from becoming hypothermic in hostile environments. Some of you might be aware of um, the very inglorious history of um, scientists studying what happens to the body when it gets very, very cold. Um, most famously uh, during the Second World War, the Nazi and the Japanese scientists who would um, literally freeze people to death to measure what would happen to their body through the course of, of the stages of hypothermia. So anytime you're on your um, um, first aid course and learning at what point you should be intervening with different things that's based on um, some quite horrific uh, research. And the scientists would keep talking about their work with the military and how they were able to um, find a place on the body that they never divulged um, because it was proprietary information that if they applied a small amount of heat, external to heat to this part of the body, um, you would stay warm for a much longer period of time. And that seems great if you're in a rescue situation. I don't know, you're on a boat and you're in a life raft and it's cold and it's inhospitable and you need to stay warm. I'm, I would guess it's your neck. You put some nice little patch on there and you stay warm and that's great. But what their work was doing was to keep snipers warm. And so the snipers would be in inhospitable, snowy, cold environments and would also need to stay still for really long periods of time. 
Um, so their work was fundamentally designed to enable people to be more effective murderers. And that was something that this researcher would present frequently and celebrate um, as something major that their field could generate because it also generated a huge amount of money. Um, exercise physiology and sports scientists uh, often generate research. They do it in my own school uh, through links with the military. Um, and so that was something that sat really uncomfortable for me um, and would be nagging at me. And when Jack and Jim mentioned this idea of um, catastrophe, I'd just been coming across work um, by a moral philosopher called Eden Williams about moral catastrophes. And so I was speaking to them about the lab as a, as a site, as a catastrophic site. And it, it's not catastrophic in the same way that environments that Danny or Kevin have been studying in any way, shape or form. They're quite nice and clean and cozy and warm. And, um, but I wanted to understand a little bit more about what that might mean um, as a, a moral project. And so Evan Williams um, provides three characteristics or criteria for us to be able to consider something as a moral catastrophe. First, there's got to be serious wrongdoing. And Evans never exactly says what this, or what might count as serious wrongdoing. Um, so he, it's difficult to say, but for me, in this analysis, I tried to identify if we could see a material harm. Um, and so, but purposeful material harm. And so, Examples of material harm in our sports worlds, there's hundreds of them. If anyone's going to tune into the eight or nine rugby games that are going to be happening over the course of this weekend, we'll be seeing some serious material harm to happening to people. Um, and we can go back further to the German Democratic Republic's um, uh, highly organised systematic doping process, the horrific stories of getting female athletes pregnant and then aborting the fetus at an appropriate time to ensure that there was increased levels of blood. Um, that would improve performance. So there's all this long-standing um, material harm that we can see in sports worlds. And it seems to me, and the point that I try to make in the chapter, is this is an incendiary or extra. It's a fundamental part of the project of sport and exercise science. And the way I like to think of it at the moment is we are quite worried about, in sports worlds, about concussion. And we've known about concussion um, diagnosed as early as the 1930s. We had researchers in Harvard studying American football games in the 20s identifying uh, that problems would happen. And I mean, it doesn't take uh, a highly skilled scientist to work out getting smacked in the head a bunch of times is not good for you. But part of that problem that doesn't seem to be discussed as far as I can tell is that it's a product of the success of sport and exercise science. So over the course of its project through the 20th century, we've created athletes that are bigger and stronger and much, much quicker. And therefore, through the success of the project, they're able to inflict far more damage on their opponents, which might be a way for accounting why we're seeing far more uh, challenges or uh, deleterious effects of, of concussion across, uh, across sporting fields. So that's something that I think that we can make the case that it's not extra, it is fundamentally inseparable as a part of the sport and exercise science project. So for me, I think that sport and exercise science work, um, beginning in the laboratory and then transferring out to the field does meet that first criteria of serious wrongdoing uh, in the form of material harm. Other people have articulated this quite well. Joe McGuire in, in the mid 2000s and then of course, Jean Marie Brown have also made this point. Um, secondly, for something to be morally catastrophic rather than just wrongdoing, it must be large scale, large, large scale, according to um, Williams. He never again doesn't give any particular um, threshold for this to be met, um, but he does give the example that a single wrongful execution or a single person being tortured, sorry, this is a really cheery subject, isn't it? Um, doesn't, doesn't meet the threshold of being uh, morally catastrophic. It is, it is um, sad, it is a, a problem, it is catastrophe for the people involved, but it's insufficient in scale to be considered a moral catastrophe. And so the Sport and Exercise Science Project, as some of our globalisation colleagues have identified, has been crucial to the expansion of sport around the globe, which has had more people being exposed to the harms um, 
and it also has involved in the um, elimination of other body cultures and other physical cultural practices. They become um, replaced by um, by sport as the dominant physical cultural form. And finally, moral catastrophes are marked by significant sections of society being culpable, and that culpability is through either action or inaction. If you're familiar with the trolley problem, um, where you can flip the switch and kill uh, five people or leave it and kill one person, um, not taking an action still makes you culpable on that. So if you've ever taught ethics and you've gone through the process of a student goes, I just wouldn't touch the switch, you'll know that's an action, you're still making a choice for something to happen. And as part of that global growth that I've mentioned before, um, and as part of, as some of our physical activity health promotion colleagues will also identify, sports scientists have become much, much more keen to move out of sport and say, actually, we've got the problem. We can fix all sorts of things if we can just get people more physically active, if you just listen to us. So not only is there a, is there a large community involved in this project, it's also A, growing numerically in terms of the size of the institutions, the number of people studying the field and the number of people producing research in the field. They're also actively seeking to colonize more areas of body culture and move out of the performance sport, put a shirt on, listen to the whistle, run, whatever it might be. They're actually trying to, um, influence the conversation about more and more forms of, of physical culture. So those are the, I, I think, it, for me, um, it's a fairly slam dunk case that we can consider sport and exercise science as morally catastrophic, but I'm not entirely sure that that's um, enough. So within the chapter, um, I tried to do a couple of things. The first thing is to analyze sport and exercise science um, as an information hazard. Now, as a field, and if any of us have tried to lose or gain weight or get a bit fitter for any kind of activity, we will have heard all sorts of theories about how we should do this, how our body works. I remember um, as a young rugby player in Christchurch, about age 14, um, you can't tell, but those who've met me in person, I'm um, six foot five and quite bean poly and the coach was determined that I needed to put on more weight. And their advice to me was get really, really fat, and then the fat will turn to muscle, which is something that, that doesn't physiologically happen. Um, and so I think that's quite an easy, uh, easy target to say, well, there's all sorts of quackery and ridiculous advice and debates. Um, Paddy Ikakakis does a brilliant job with high intensity interval training at the moment, identifying the quackery that's an underpinning that. But I wanted to set my sights on dealing with knowledge that we have a reasonable case to assume is true. So it, for me, it's not just a matter of let's cherry pick examples of stupid ideas um, that uh, exercise scientists have had. Historically, they were giving um, cyclists champagne um, midway through races as a way to pick them up and don't have a leucozade, have a champagne. Um, smoking was thought to be really key for aerobic endurance athletes because it was training for the lungs. That would be all very easy to pick on. Um, but I want to focus on information hazards, which um, Nick Bostrom, uh, he defines information hazards, uh, things that cause or enable someone to cause harm because it's true. And that's why I was focusing in this uh, project not on the ideas of this was a dumb idea, I can't believe you got people to do this, but what were the actual good ideas, the true ideas that have actually gone through and influenced how people um, uh, enjoy and experience or don't enjoy and experience uh, physical activity, uh, sport and exercise. And the case study I guess I use is tracing the emergence of the treadmill. Um, Jack, I think you're with me on this. I hate exercise. Um, that's awful. But I would, I like being physically active and doing doing other things. So treadmill is especially my idea of of health. And if there's treadmill users among us, that's excellent. Good for you. Um, with the treadmill, we've got a long, long history of tread wheels. They go way back to at least the Roman times, uh, where people would use usually slaves as a way to uh, generate mechanical force for some other activity to happen. The modern treadmills, we uh, realize it was first introduced in prison um, as labor's, labor for uh, by a bloke named William Cubitt, and he installed this in the Suffolk County Jail in, um, 
by the dates in the book, 1820-ish. Um, and his motives and ideas were very similar to the physical culturalists at the time. And if you're not familiar with physical culturalists, we don't have time to go up. But imagine people like Wim Hof, but it's in the 1800s and early 1900s. They're setting ideas for how people should be moving and experiencing their bodies. Um, and he was concerned that there was insufficient activity amongst criminals who were in prison. Um, he wasn't concerned about this from um, a health perspective, but from a moral perspective and idle hands make the devil's work kind of thing. And so what he saw was a wasteful idleness of prison inmates. And so what he got to, the idea was, was actually what we can start to do is we can bring in at that stage tread wheels so that our prisoners can generate mechanical force and we can use that for some kind of um, productive labor. Um, and a lot of prison reformers championed this. They thought it was a great idea. Uh, a key one among them was um, uh, Jeremy Bentham. So anyone who's read Foucault and the idea of the panopticon, you know that you're quite keen on treadmills. Um, and so he was advocating this as a form of productive hard labor for prisoners. And this has got a really long history of, of hard labor for, for prisoners or slaves. But what was particularly attractive to um, people like William Cuber and then others later was that the treadmill had the ability to quantify and meticulously control workload, which was something that couldn't be done previously. Some of the prison reformers liked that because they knew that they then meant there was nowhere to hide. We couldn't have prisoners pretending to be working very hard. We actually were able to quantify and show whether they make sure they were working hard. But then a bloke called Edward Smith, who was a, um, a physiologist, he's probably a founding figure of exercise physiology, but identified himself as um, a, a general physiologist, was really upset with this work. And we're probably all thinking, that's great, we don't want people doing hard labor. But he was upset because it was wasteful. And he was much more concerned with the possibility for quantifying the workload. And he didn't care about whether it was useful or productive labor. He identified the ability to quantify carefully uh, workload. And so he went through a series of field defining or field establishing research um, that set the standard for all subsequent research in, the, in sport and exercise science that has ever used a treadmill, a rowing agonometer. Uh, um, Jim, I'm not sure if you've been on the, on the bikes and the in any of the laboratories, but anytime they start to use these kind of machines, it's all got the, which are focused on quantifying output of, of our bodies. Um, that was something that was traced directly to prison reform, which gave um, a literal element to Jean-Marie Brougham's metaphor of sport being the prison of measured time. And uh, during my ethnographic work, uh, a new laboratory was opened. And once they had all sorts of amazing and incredibly expensive equipment near gas exchange analysis and centrifuges for spinning blood and um, all sorts of ECGs and, and um, impressive technology. But on the day the uh, treadmill arrived, one of the uh, a PhD student was in the lab and said, we're finally a real exercise physiology lab now. Um, and so through tracing the establishment of the field, um, has essentially saying that prison work wasn't hard enough, um, I think lead, well, leads me to then trace uh, th further changes or, or not in the logic, the ideology of sport and exercise science, which um, continues to be evident through in the same logic. I don't think if Edward Smith walked into an exercise physiology lab nearly 200 years later, he would find um, things particularly different. And that isn't, in the chapter I argue, because of consistency of knowledge. There has been significant changes, advances, regressions, debates, and arguments about all, all the, the physiological processes that underpin um, how our bodies respond to movement. And what's particularly shocking to me is certainly uh, the last time I was in this literature, which was about 18 months ago, there's still no clear answer for why our heart rate increases once we engage in physical activity. They don't understand perfectly the mechanisms for why that goes. So something we all experience and know and understand viscerally, we don't have a clear scientific explanation for it yet. So there has been significant change and there's been other things that haven't uh, changed in knowledge, which is why I was focusing in this chapter on knowledge that is, is true. 
And I think because of that morally catastrophic nature of the ideological positioning of sport and exercise science as a field that's grown out of uh, prisons is fundamentally still connected to uh, the industrial military complex and has only picked up um, out of that prison further um, repressive and dominating fields of practice, um, we can still consider that quite fundamentally um, a, a moral catastrophe, which is why as we see the growth of this field moving more into identifying um, health agendas and seeking to help uh, uh, um, establish health agendas, and the change in uh, people like Joe in the room uh, met brilliantly how the, the policy agenda changes from sports organization pushing sport to pushing physical activity as, as a panacea for all health concerns, um, I think leads us down a really problematic road that can't be fixed by more accurate uh, information. And that's why I think we should be considering uh, the laboratory, the sport and exercise science uh, laboratory is a site of moral catastrophe because of its production of informational hazards, that it's producing significant harm because of knowledge that's true. So through the chapter and bringing it, uh, bring us to a close that I'm not trying to present an a priori critique of epistemological positions of positivistic research. We can leave that to the to the uh, Josh Newmans and, and physical cultural studies people um, to conduct that. And I'm also not saying that we should just abandon all um, laboratory-based research and just set up social scientific research labs. Um, but what I'm trying to articulate following um, my standard science and technology studies training is that scientific activity like sport and exercise science um, as a basis for the production of experts and expertise as a fundamentally social activity reliant on social institutions, social contracts, social practice and social organizations. And so what I uh, hope to articulate for you in the chapter is understanding uh, sport and exercise science as a, um, uh, a moral, morally catastrophic site is the idea is that we don't see the field as uh, as others have articulated, um, notably Andy Johnson, that the that the, the practice of these scientists is um, a production of technical norms and values condensed through the empirical, but it's a materialization of the theoretical. It's the realization of the ideological project of a field that is rooted fundamentally um, in a dehumanizing institutions of prison, military, and uh, elite sport. So uh, I'm not sure I've got a, a, a neat way to, to wrap this up, um, but ev evidently there's a, a consistent ideological positioning of the field from its first emergence in the projects, laboratories, and journals of uh, our learned societies present in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, that has adopted new truth techniques that were already established in other fields and transferred them in a highly problematic way to, for us, uh, fitness, health, and leisure practices. Okay? okay, brilliant. Yeah, thanks for that, Cass. Uh, yeah, some uh, interesting connections drawn there and, and obviously expand upon in in the chapter as well so uh thank you very much thank you i know we don't get to clap i can't really clap can you on zoom and everything but uh i think there's the little reaction thing we can do i just want to thank all our speakers for their presentations um just then um i know we've got some questions so um I've, we've got quite a few in the chat which we can which i'm going to work through now so i'll do if you do have a question you want to ask uh, any of the speakers just do the little whack your little hand up thing uh, and i'll come to you i'll start in the chat first though um uh, and then I'll go to the room and I'll, I'll, I'll switch between the two. So the first uh, question um, I've got here is from Joanne. It's for Danny. Um, Danny, you mentioned that upkeep, upkeep and maintenance need to be undertaken. Um, have any of the sites then been destroyed, damaged during the continued conflict? And do any of the skates take the activity out onto the streets beyond the parks, if that is possible? Um, thank you for your question. Yeah. Um... 
So none of Skate Pals parks have been um, damaged as far as I'm aware um, and not destroyed. Um, but the, the skate parks do often experience um, interactions with Israeli military, especially the one in Jeyus. Um, and there's a skate park which hasn't been built by Skate Park, but was built by Skate Aid, which is in the, the Bethlehem SOS Children's Village, which is a, a refugee um, village. And um, the skate park there is kind of quite in close proximity to a, a checkpoint. And you tend to get situations where tear gas has been let off quite nearby and, and that kind of wafts through the park. And I, I've never actually visited that skate park, but a good friend of mine who's visited it um, was telling me about a time that, that he was there and that there was just all this tear gas and the kids were just still skating around in the tear gas and like with like tears streaming down their faces. They were just so used to it. It's pretty upsetting, really. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it's not so much uh, been destroyed, but the, there's just lots of kind of weird moments that will happen really like that. And then, um, yeah, and some some skaters do skate on the, in the streets um, and again, do come uh, come into sort of contact with the Israeli military sometimes. Um, in various ways, so it's it's uh, it's not very it's not very straightforward place, <laughs> really. I hope that answers your questions. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to jump in because I'm, I know Tom's got one. Well, Tom Critchley's just asked one, which I think is, as he says, there's an offshoot from Joanne's. Um, has Skatepal ever been in direct conversation with the Israeli government or had any communication with them? No, no. Um, no, not to my knowledge, no. Um, and that's partly, yeah, I think that's, and that, I'm not sure why you're asking, Tom, is, is, have you got, what are your thoughts with regards to that? Just, sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> it's all right, I was just like warming some soup as well. <laughs> um, like, I guess, like, um, in some degree, I guess you alluded to it in your presentation that, Kind of the work of Skate Pal kind of stands in contrast with their sort of occu occupation. Um, have they ever? I mean, I'm sure they obviously make work hard for Skate Pal, but I wonder if they've ever directly just like been in contact with you about any issues or anything like that. No, yeah, I mean, Skate Pal operate apolitically, so they're very they have to do that because um, Israel will very easily just stop people from entering, and they have done for, for various people. Um, and so skate power are just you know, very, very apolitical. Um, but also there's a thing about anti-normalization. So any kind of relationships with Israel are not, would not be, would not work well really in that context. Um, yeah, yeah, no. I didn't mean like, like, yeah, like kind of like working together or anything like that, but I just like, how aware are they of skate power, I guess, was that also kind of question? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't think they're that aware, but who knows? <laughs> Okay. Um. Uh. Thanks. Uh. Thanks, Tom. Um. And we'll just we'll, we'll jump to uh, we'll stick with you, Danny, because uh, we've got a question here from Lukeman as well. Uh, Danny, I was wondering how did participants feel about permanency or temporal existence of the skate park from war consequence like bombing? Did you sense a difference in experience as participants, especially adult female, stop using the skate park due to the social pressure you mentioned? Um, so, uh, yeah, the, um, that's a good question. So my, my perception really is that Palestinians, um, obviously have this like real precarity around their physical spaces, but they, they're very resilient and want to continue building things, even if they do end up getting destroyed, um, and kind of keep returning to keep rebuilding things um in the west bank in in the parts of the west bank that i've worked with skate pile those that hasn't happened um in recent years um and so um i think that but i think that's the attitude of palestinians in general really um and then to answer your second question um so 
I don't have a lot of understanding really about adult female participants um, once, you know, they once girls stop using the park. And that's partly because um, I haven't got to that point in the research and partly because the, the park is relatively new. So it was built in 2015. So in a way, that's a really good question for something that the research could go on to do really is to sort of like actually map track the experience of some of the girls who've like really taken it up and really are interested in it and then seeing what happens as they get older and then kind of exploring that because that's something I don't really know but thank you for your question yeah no thank you both thank you Lukeman thank you Danny uh, I'm going to jump to uh, Kev and I've got Luke's uh, question here for you uh, during your exploring of ruined Christchurch did you encounter non-urban explorers and if so how did they regard what you were doing did they get it? Did they find it objectionable? And how did those encounters go? Did they affect how you felt about the open reading, leisure possibilities of these, these constructed buildings, streets, neighbourhoods that you were enacting? Um, yeah, so we did, we encountered lots of other Rebecca's doing the same sort of thing. And I would, I would argue that they shared the similar sort of view in terms of finding lots of in, invisible cities. I would argue that anyone not interested in urbex doesn't quite view it in the same manner though. Um, we've met people, for instance, sometimes we'd go and sleep in abandoned apartments or houses and things like that. And occasionally you'd get woken up by uh, a disgruntled passerby or perhaps if there was someone still living in a house nearby, they'd notice that you were, because they were quite alert, they would notice that someone was in there not doing, you know, doing stuff you shouldn't be. And they would be quite annoyed. And understandably, I get that because it's people's hometowns, it's people's sort of, it's, you know, they, they view Christchurch in a very different way to the way that we're viewing it and um, so I do understand that um, there's also the security guards as well so some of the protected sites had security guards and obviously they view things in a very different manner um, so often it's a little bit of cat and mouse with those guys um, so you'd be not, that in many ways that's part of the, the appeal for urban explorers um, so I'd say you do encounter people that find it um, different yeah yeah, um, thanks, uh, Kevin. And we've got a question here from Danny. Uh, who tends to take part in urbex? It's quite demographically mixed. Um, I think that in the early days, it was quite a small kind of population that was very much kind of, I suppose, very male dominated, um, very much kind of like white males, I suppose. Um, but things have changed, particularly in recent years. Um, and there's all sorts of um sort of don't know what you want to call them little sort of side tribes or different kind of um groups that have, have got interested in it. i think that the the big thing that changed is instagram and youtube so they've made it much more um kind of recognizable really because when i first got interested in urban exploration i didn't know it was called urban exploration it's just something we used to do in our local town just go and abandon buildings for the fun of it it only really gained a name um, when i started researching it um, or around that sort of time. Um, so I think it's more inclusive in terms of the Instagram and the YouTube in that sense. But And there's a lot of conflict between the older people of um, a little bit perhaps more traditional, have got different ideas about what urbex should be um, as opposed to the, the Instagrammable stuff. So I hope that answers that. Uh, no, thanks. And I'm just going to jump to uh, Joe Pigging because I know he's got his, he's raised his hand there. So hello, Joe. Good to see you. Thank you, Jack. And and oh, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you, Jack, for that. And and thank you to everybody for the talks. For fabulous. What a fabulous way to spend my evening. Thank you for that. Um, look, I'm, I must say, I'll, as you probably detect, I'm from New Zealand, as Cass mentioned too. Um, so so uh, you know, a lot of this was was great to great to see and and hear and listen to and and thank you, Danny, for your talk. A um, lot, lot, lot of the visual uh, imagery um, and well, certainly the first two talks, <laughs> um, yeah, was was really really uh, quite uh, captivating and 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 Cass, you you really provoked with your language, you, you know, uh, uh, you know. So thank you for that. Um, uh, look, I, I wrote a, a whole lot of notes, but but pe perhaps um, trying to um, sort of consolidate some of this in, into into a question, perhaps for, for everybody. Um, I I got the feeling that that all of the talks were influenced by 
uh, I guess, permissions or legalities uh, or and, and borders and, and crossing borders, where, where, whether it was to do with occupations or red zones, you know, we might or might not be allowed to go. Um, so so th th those were some, some themes that resonated for me. Um, and so I, I, to, to bring my question to the, these catastrophes that we're all facing more and more often in different ways, um, uh, I, am I right in thinking that these catastrophes have different rules and permissions that, that come with them. And as a result, uh, powerful people who are making these rules and sometimes even imposing catastrophes on people. Um, and so I, I wrote here, do we as, as academics and, and citizens and residents, um, do we push back actively against these, these um, permissions or, or, or what's not allowed? Um, or is it more subtle than that? Is it about um, transcending power subtly, um, you know, working within power structures or, 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 or operating outside of them? Um, so look, just, just a, a, a general question and, and probably relevant for, for Cass as well and, and probably resonates with what uh, Danny asked about um, Cass in terms of, did I see it there in terms of acting ethically uh, uh, within sport and, and exercise science. So there you go. Sorry for my monologue, um, but um, look, I'll mute myself now. Thank you, everybody. No, that was wonderful, Joe. Thank you. I'm, I'm, without putting anyone on the spot, I'm just going to open it up to the room if anyone has anything to speak to what um, Joe was referring to there. Um. By all means, unmute yourself, Danny, if you did have something. <laughs> I was going to say Tom go because I. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I think I mistook the uh, clap for the hand <laughs> gestures in the end. Um, I was going to jump in and just say from my ex well in the chapter that I wrote, I like mentioned or well, there's a section about the kind of like, um, kind of prefigurative skate park before the Freedom Skate Park, which was one that I was involved with, which was like a um a DIY skate park that was built by the Jamaican skateboarding community. Um, and that was sort of in um, drawing from the language of a, another chapter, like the residue of colonialism in like a physical space, which was sort of like a failed, like a uh, waterway. Um, and, you know, that is a technically illegal sort of like semi, well, illegal in the sense of just going to building a skate park in a, in a space that's not yours, but, um, yeah the idea of like pushing boundaries um is quite like inherent within skateboarding even if that is you know within the structured skateboarding classes of pushing yourself and persevering and trying new things or in the more like subcultural sort of uh understanding of skateboarding as kind of like a subversive -y kind of practice um which like yeah it may or may not be but that was my thoughts on on, on that one joe No, like yeah. if, it could, I, I wouldn't mind jumping in there as well, yeah. just in terms of answering that question, Luke's question there about things that we maybe didn't get the chance to explore in the book and what we would uh, possibly do in the future. And I hope this answers your, your question, albeit partially, Joe. And, and that is that I think one of the... So one of the issues I think we have at present, especially with things like climate change, which is my area of interest and, and nature, is that we're often not permitted to enter spaces where um, we can engage with climate. So one of the issues I always have with land ownership is, is with privatization and enclosure. If we don't have access to these spaces, then we can't find uh, the feelings and, and the language uh, and the forms of engagement that allow us to engage with these problems in the first place. So I would say in the context of climate change, that that permissibility or lack thereof is certainly one of the things that I find problematic. And linked with that, uh, in terms of the question, Luke's question of things we would like to see more of, that that's something I would like to explore much more is, so Blanche Verley, who kindly wrote us a, um, uh, a, a sort of recommendation for the book, she's doing some really fantastic work at the minute on the kind of phenomenological aspects of climate change and how we feel or don't feel climate change 
how we're prevented from understanding uh, how really small scale changes in climate can influence us as subjects and change our level of agency and prevent us from doing certain things. And, and whilst there's some fantastic research on this in the context of sport in terms of the kind of the general inconveniences that climate change um, might uh, might have in the context of sport in that it kind of it changes how events are run it's it prevents us from running tennis tournaments because we're ingesting smog we're inhaling smog i think there's there's a, there's a, a scope there to do more of that research that phenomenological research on how it affects us and also therefore how that might um might might kind of change the subjects as well change our subjectivity and therefore uh, influence how sports are kind of governed and managed and run in the future so yeah I, I think that's to answer Luke's question as well I think that's where I'd like to take this um, in the future yeah no thanks Jim um, and I do I just want to make sure I, I know we're, I know we're sort of approaching nine o'clock but I want to make sure everyone uh, uh, has a question and I think uh, Danny's to Cass's is is quite the question um, uh, really interesting uh, so this is for Cass, sorry. How do we go forward ethically with sport and exercise science? So sort of uh, what I call a million dollar question there, I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah. In the first instance, in the health space, I don't think we need any sport and exercise science research. Um, put simply, and I think that can work in, in a couple of ways. It's with that idea of information hazards. It's almost certain that almost all of the time, some more movement will be helpful for people. So we don't need resources, time, effort, and expenditure wasted on trying to quantify that. Um, and so I think part of that, to, to Joe's question, is working inside some structures. Um, I sit with various ethics committees, and I had a very long stash with some researchers because their study was unethical. They were wanting to see if there was a change in cardiac function as a result of an exercise intervention. And in their information to participants, they listed a benefit of participating in the research was that they would have improved cardiac functioning. So there was no clinical equipoise. There was no doubt in the researcher's mind of what was going to happen. So we don't need them in the health space at all, uh, in my opinion. The, the sports space, I think, is slightly, slightly more challenging. Um, and I can think of uh, Lords can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Um, and I think particularly in an interesting area is there's been increased advocacy for, um, from an equity perspective of researching, um, including more women athletes in sport and exercise science research. And that's kind of a double-edged sword because from a gender equity perspective, it's a no-brainer. Um, and in fact, I've advocated to some people, if you want a career, just go and find a dozen exercise uh, physiology papers that had the 10 blokes in them and change it to 10 women and you'll race through. Um, but also then you're bringing more a different sector of society into um, a, a highly problematic and damaging uh, system and you can think of the, the, the racial politics of, of sport in North America particularly which is bringing more people into that system so uh, I, I have a clear answer for the health agenda for the sport I uh, not so much um, and I think part of that of responding to that as you say about ethical is, is people joining ethics committees and asking them um, you know, it, do you have any doubt that this is actually going to work <laughs> and when they say no well, why are you doing this um, doesn't make me very popular at times, but I think that's some of the work that we, I think that's the, one of the few times a social scientist like me might give you a concrete course of action that you could actually follow. No, that was great. No, thank you, Cass. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold it there. I'm gonna pass over to, to Luke. I'm not sure if you wanna say something just to, just to conclude today. Uh, just for myself, I just wanna thank all the presenters for presenting and also the attendees as well uh, for your questions and, and for being here. Um, Luke, I'll pass over to you. Jack, can I just um, oh, say Jim. one thing before we finish, and that's to thank everyone who contributed to the book. Um, we were warned by colleagues that were far more senior and and more uh, had more sense than us not to do an editor collection for various reasons. But I have to say, and I'm, I'm confident Jack agrees with this, that every one of the contributors has been a pleasure to work with. And um, some of the chapters are just, all of the chapters are just fantastic. So uh, it was a really pleasurable, pro genuinely pleasurable process. And um, 
I'm really happy with the outcome. No, definitely. I think people think we're making it up when we say how much fun and how <laughs> and how smooth it was to do. And I know that's only dependent upon the, the people who actually contribute. So, yeah, so thanks. Yeah, thanks from both of us. Uh, just very quick closing remark from me. Um, thanks, J Jim and Jack, for um, hosting everything so smoothly. Thanks, everyone, for contributing. Um, and uh, I put a question in the chat. Um, uh, we seem to have got everybody still here, so I can ask the question live. Um, does anybody want me to wait 24 hours before um, uploading the video? I've, I've undertaken to wait 24 hours, but it just seems to me, since I've all got you here, you could tell me whether or not I need to do that. And I'm going to take it from the gestures I can see by movement of faces and bodies that you're fairly relaxed and that anyone who wants to uh, otherwise uh, tell me to hold back, we'll, we'll get in touch pretty quickly, but otherwise it'll be uploaded to some point tomorrow and come around by all the usual channels. And uh, Jim and Jack, you can use it to your heart's content for uh, publicising your, your wonderful publication. So thank you, everybody. And uh, good evening. We're done. Thank you. Thanks, Luke, and thanks, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.